In structural engineering, in a lot of design classes, we typically start by teaching how to compute the strength of a particular member. However, that's not all there is to it. In addition to strength, you also have to consider serviceability requirements, things like vibration control or crack control or deflections, all become major important factors in the functionality and usability of a structure. In this video, we'll begin our discussions of serviceability, um, particularly with regards to crack control. So without further ado, let's get started. In structures, we define a term known as structural adequacy to mean two different things. The first one is that a structure must be capable of supporting the loads. This is the strength requirement for a structure or for a member. The second requirement is serviceability, which means that this member, when loaded, performs the way that it's intended to, that deflections are not excessive, that vibrations are not noticeable. Those kind of things all become factors that affect the, the human's perception of the quality of the structure. Um, we don't want a beam, you know, in the middle of a floor to deflect too much or else you'll, you know, humans by nature get uncomfortable um, when things move too much or they feel like they're not plumb or square or those kind of things. And so this is what serviceability is intended to be or these non-strength uh, parameters often associated with, you know, the durability of a structure or the, or the deflective characteristics of a structure. In this series, in today's video, we're going to be looking primarily at the crack control provisions from ACI, and we'll talk about some methods that, from older versions um, that are still used to this day to assess the, you know, how well cracking is being handled by the reinforcing steel. In later videos, we'll get into long-term and short-term deflections, and that will be coming up uh, very soon after this one. So we'll get ourselves kind of going here and start off by talking about uh, the crack control provisions. Okay, so basically, um, crack control is handled indirectly uh, by the ACI code by defining rules for the distribution of reinforcement in beams and one-way slabs. You know, prior to recent versions of the code, this was much more explicit in which we actually calculated um, the, uh, a, a parameter based off of spacing requirements and, and those kind of things. Um, there were two popular formulas that were that were uh, typically used. The first one is known as the gurgley lutz equation, okay, in which this parameter W was equal to 0 0.76 times beta times the stress in the steel, um, the average stress that is, um, times the cubed root of DC times A. And I'll show you a picture here in a second of what these parameters are, but by now you should have a pretty good idea as a guess to what they are. Okay, and then a different equation was presented by Frosch, which is the 2000 over uh, times FS over ES times beta times the square root of DC squared plus S over two quantity squared. Okay, and so for many years, these equations provided a means for ensuring the adequate distribution of reinforcement in beams and slabs. And what it does is it basically takes an effective area around the tensile reinforcing and calculates what the, the, it's almost like a percentage calculation, but what the, what the distribution of the steel versus the area that it's responsible for preventing the tensile value, okay? And so one single big bar does not do as good a job in this equation as does multiple little bars spread throughout the cross section. And that's kind of the idea and the concept that we're looking at accommodating here. All right, so, all right. So here's what the terms are. Okay, Let me pull this down here a little bit. Okay, so. If we look at it, it's kind of a typical cross section that I have here, width of B, and I have just kind of an arbitrary reinforcement pattern. And in this case, it's five bars. Three of them are bigger bars. Two of them are smaller. And again, we're not going to get into specifics about the bars, but I'm just going to kind of point out the terms that came out of those first equations. Okay, the center of gravity of this pattern you can find by, uh, find by taking the areas times their distance from our, an arbitrary reference. And so obviously, if I had the same amount of steel in two layers, the center of gravity of the pattern would be at the midpoint between the two rows of steel. However, when it's off center, we have to do that weighted calculation that we've showed you in previous videos. Okay, and that's the term DCG. Okay, now what happens is that there is an, it is assumed that the, um, 
the effective area and tension that's being controlled by the steel is this shaded portion. So if DCG is from the bottom edge of the beam, and again, we're assuming a positive moment where cracking is in the bottom, the same rules apply for negative moments when you'd be measuring from the top, but the center of gravity dimension, the effective area of concrete uh, attributed to these areas of steel is basically double that value. Okay, and so if it's DCG from here to the centroid, then the total height of the block that's effective um, on this is twice that, two times DCG gives me the area of this. Okay, now we can kind of look at um, some other parameters that will show up. Um, we can define an H1 parameter as being the distance from the neutral axis to that centroid. Okay, and this is a lot like how we calculated the depth in singly reinforced beams, how it always went to the center of gravity of the steel pattern. For a single layer of steel, that center of gravity is actually the dimension to the location of the steel, but because of these extra bars, it gets pulled up ever so slightly. Okay, the term DC that you saw in the Frosch equation and the gurgley lutz equations is actually the distance from the tensile face to the center of the first row of steel. Okay, so it's not the DCG value, it's actually going to the center of this bar, so that's my DC. Okay, and then we'll define H2 dimension as being the neutral axis down to the tensile face. So in our case, the tensile face is this bottom edge of the beam. Okay, all right, so the term, the other equations that you saw, okay, that we can define FS. This is the service load stress in the reinforcement. So these are all serviceability calculations. It's not an ultimate calculation. We're not using factor loads. We're going back and almost like what we did with the elastic stress analysis in Flexur. We're coming back and we're calculating FS. Now we're going to, um, assume that FS is taken as 60% of the yield stress, okay? And so that will be our parameter for FS. The DC parameter we've described, that's the distance from the extreme tension fiber to the center of the reinforcing bar uh, located closest to it. So again, if this was my tensile face, this is the bars closest to it, so that's the DC parameter, okay? And that's measured in inches. Now notice that the reinforcement stress is measured in KSI, okay? So we've gotten into issues in you know, like shear design in, in those cases where we gotta watch the units. And this one, this FS value goes in as a KSI parameter on there, okay? And then DC is inches, okay? The area then, this A, is the effective tension area of concrete, which is that shaded region we had here. So that's my A. So it's 2DG times B for this member, for this simple rectangular member, or sorry, uh, DCG. Okay, oh, so, so this is the effective tension area of concrete shaded region surrounding the tensile reinforcement and having the same centroid as that reinforcement uh, divided by uh, divided that's a D, divided by the number of bars or wires. So we're going to take the number of wires that are being held in that area and basically divide that. So even though the bars are different sizes, we're looking at you know in this case having five bars. Okay, now as opposed to, and, and, th and it works out that smaller bars typically require more to account for the same area of steel. You know, I can do one number nine, what takes me, you know, two number sevens. You know, not exactly, but you, but you get the idea is that, you know, but that's how we can kind of tweak the end. And so your goal then is to get this A number as small as possible, okay? And so we're going to take the A effective, which is two times B times DG, and then we're gonna divide it by the number of bars, okay? And that's my A parameter that we saw in those equations, okay? The W that we're calculating out of the Frosch equation and the gurgley lutz equation then, okay, is basically the crack, the estimated crack width in units of 0 .001 inches, you know, thousandths of an inch. So we're looking at very small numbers. This number will be something typically on the order of like 100 or 200 um, will be the parameter that we're getting here. And then uh, the beta is the distance from the neutral axis to the bottom fiber divided by the distance to the reinforcement. So this is where those H2 and H1 parameters are gonna come in. Okay, now, kind of as a rule of thumb for you know, a well-proportioned uh, beam, we can say that a rule of thumb that for beams, this beta is somewhere around 1.2 usually, and for slabs, it's generally around 1.35. Um, so you can use those kind of rules of thumb to kind of get you started to see if you're gonna have an issue with crack control. You'll find out real quick that this, these calculations set themselves up very nicely with spreadsheets that you can just kind of automate the different parameters and you can play with dimensions of beams versus number of bars and you can quickly run through these calculations, especially the gurgly LUTs. Okay, all right, so now the way that we start to analyze this, and again, this isn't in your textbook and it's not explicitly in the ACI code, but it's kind of the way that we can evaluate based off of the gurgly LUTs method is that the rule of thumb for this is that we're gonna define a parameter Z as being that W parameter 
okay, divided by 0 0.076 multiplied by B, okay? And so then what happens is, is that for, you know, um, for a W of 13, again, okay, again, this is in units of, a, you know, one thousandths of an inch, the Z corresponding is 145, okay? And for W equal to 16, again, in units of a thousandth of an inch, the Z corresponding is a 175, okay? So all we do then is that we derive out the, the gurgley lutz equation and then we modify it into this Z parameter, which is kind of our crack characteristic. And we calculate Z as then being the FS, our stress value, multiplied by the cubed root of the square root of DCA. That is that gurgley lutz equation explicitly. Okay, and then we limit Z to being 145 for exterior exposures, exposed to the elements, okay, where crack and wider cracks would be a bigger problem, okay, versus interior exposure where it's protected from the elements and Z is allowed to be 175, okay? And so that's how we start to kind of analyze, you know, uh, this depending on whether it's exterior or whether it's interior, that sets our Z parameter. And then all it is is it's just simply a check of the distribution of the steel that you have. We take our DC for the layout that we choose, we compute the A for the layout that we choose, we have our FS, and then that's our equation for calculating Z. It's very, very easy, very, very straightforward. Okay, now one of the problems that we have in this is that this looks like it's a well-defined formula, you know, that, but it's hard to reproduce these results in a lab. Okay, and part of that is because that even in laboratory experiments, it's um, crack control characteristic is very hard to predict accurately. So, you know, over the past, you know, quarter century, you know, uh, because of this, you know, we can't go out in the field and measure Z or measure W um, explicitly because, again, even under the same loading, the same testing, our cracks will vary a, a significant amount. So what ACI has done over the last, you know, couple of code releases is they've moved toward a more practical method and away from the gurgly lutz method. But I still like the gurgly lutz method just because it kind of gives me a sense of better definition and better control over trying to figure out how to distribute the steel within the cross section. All right, the ACI code currently in the 19, 318-19, instead of having you calculate crack provisions, they try to, to accommodate for, for things uh, based off of these max spacing provisions. And you can find these down in uh, section 24.3.2, okay, or in this case, it's the table 24.3.2, which is maximum spacing of bonded reinforcement and non-pre-stressed and class C pre-stressed one-way slabs and beams, okay? So these are the crack control characteristics, okay? And in all of these equations, you can see like the first one, that if I have a deformed bars or sizes, it's the lesser of these two values, 15 times 40,000 over FS minus 2.5 uh, times C, C sub C or 12 times 40,000 over S F of S, okay? That's the lesser of those two. And then likewise, if you get into pre-stress and strain, you have your requirements here. And then if we combine pre-stressing with deformed bars, then it's another form of this equation. So we're going to be mostly playing with what's up here. This is the, the provisions. And so this is the maximum spacing allowed between longitudinal bars, all right? The idea being that if they get too far apart, then I'm able to develop cracks between the two because the strains are able to, um, we need to be able to have some, some control over those. All right, so in this, in this equation, C sub C is the clear cover of concrete measured perpendicular to the tension phase of the cross section. So this is kind of um, that DC dimension that we saw before, okay? And then FS is again, the service level stress and the tensile reinforcement. Again, this is gonna be measured um, as 0 0.6 times FY, 60% is kind of the service level limit. Okay, now notice in this equation, FS is now in PSI. So it's kind of changed between the formulas on those. All right, so if we look at that, then as we said, just to kind of blow it up a little bit more so you can see it, these are the equations for S max for the spacings between, between, the, between the two. And it's the smaller of these two particular values. Okay, all right. All right, other provisions that, have, that go into this, okay, is that, okay, um, explicitly in ACI 24.3.2.1, we say that FS may be taken as two thirds of FY. Well, again, this is 0 0.67. We're just taking a rule of thumb of 0 0.6. It's the same characteristic. So there's no difference to what they were doing before. They actually give you a little bit more on this. Okay, um, some special considerations, because again, the code is trying to handle all situations, not just specific layouts. Um, ACI 24.3.3 says that if only one bar, then the maximum width of the cross-section BW must be less than the max spacing 
S of um, given out of that table equation. Okay, and that's to, uh, to ensure that again, you know, because the idea is in this that if if this is my rectangular section, I only put one bar. Okay, well then I'm worried about cracking between him and the edge. That if this is BW, okay, then this would be half of that, and this would be the other half. So that's why we got to make sure that. That, that this width is less than the, that clear spacing that exists between the bars. So that's kind of what we're doing here. Okay, all right. For T-beams in tension, where the flange is in tension, so this would be a, like in this case a negative moment on a T-beam, okay, where I put steel up in the, in the top. Remember that when we did flange beams, there was an effective width check that you had to do for strength, okay, well, what they say is they say that the bars, in order to control the, the cracking, Okay, so be effective is defined as before. Okay, and then you, you have to account for that if this LN, which is the clear span of the beam, okay, divided by 10 is the outer limits of where the steel has to be placed. Okay, that if that limit uh, LN over 10 is greater than the be effective, then the additional bonded reinforcement is required in the outer portions of the flange. You have to keep adding more until you account for for basically getting steel distributed over the entire effective length or the effective flange width. Because remember, in T-beams, when we calculated it, your beam may have actually been something considerably larger, okay? But we limit it to be effective, and then they say that you have to spread this steel, okay, you know, such that if LN over 10, you know, is some value that is um, less than be effective, then you have to make sure that you would distribute this steel over the entire effective width. Okay, and so that's one of the other requirements that they have. And then carrying on, um, they also have provisions for shrinkage steel. Okay, because if I don't put shrinkage steel into slabs, then I get a lot of cracking in the surfaces, and that again, that's a problem. Okay, and so they establish some minimum ratios on this. Okay, so 24.4.3.2, the minimum ratio is taken as the area of tensile steel divided by the gross area of the concrete, and that has to be greater than or equal to 0.0018. Okay, that's our minimum. Okay, and then we also have a shrinkage steel sets the spacing limit. If it's just for shrinkage steel as opposed to strength, you choose the smaller of either five times H, where H is the thickness of the slab, or 18 inches. But you have to get steel distributed along there. So you're kind of playing both of these. And a lot of times it ends up being something like, you know, a number four, uh, you know, 12 inches on center will typically do the job for, you know, a six or eight inch slab. It's kind of the sense of the sizes of it. It's not a huge bar required for shrinkage steel because again, they want the bars close enough together that it helps resist that cracking. And, the, you know, even if it does crack, it keeps those cracks from growing and opening up in a significant way. Okay. All right. So that's kind of the, the way that we're going to kind of look at the characteristics. For those of you that are in my class, okay, the worksheet looks something kind of like this. Okay, and this is what I'll have you guys work on for next time, is that first thing that we're going to do is for, and I've got a couple of different examples for bar distributions on here. So for the first one, I have a cross section that is 16 inches wide. It has a, a DC dimension of two and a half inches, or sorry, one and a half inches. And we're looking at putting two number 11 bars in this for Fletcher. And we're going to evaluate the, the, the characteristics of cracking based off of this gurgle lutz methodology. So you're going to calculate the area of steel, look at the number of bars, locate the centroid, and we're going to compute the allowable stress. Again, all very simple. Calculate your gurgle lutz criteria, and then ask yourself, is this acceptable? So you're going to take that Z parameter that you calculate, and you're going to compare it to those limits that we had um, for interior and exterior um, as kind of a Z max. Okay, if you're less than that number, you're okay. If you're greater than that number, you're not. Okay, and so we want to make sure that we keep the smaller Z values are typically better. The cracks don't open up as much. Okay, okay, so then we're going to also calculate, um, kind of on an unrelated note, compute the S max for these particular dimensions, okay, and then find out is this section, you know, acceptable for those particular requirements. Okay, and we can kind of look at, you know, figure out, well, what's my spacing need to be? You know, and this is similar to what we did when we were, you know, doing the design of SRR beams in which I took the side cover plus the stirrup plus the gap distance, you know, you know, plus the bar diameter, then clear spacing between them and piled that up and checked the, you know, that against the maximum width on this, okay? Well, the unknown is what is that dimension right there, okay? And so we've got to make sure that that guy does not exceed the S max that you're being asked to calculate here. And that's what we mean by is this section acceptable for reinforcement 
uh, spacing requirements. Okay, because sometimes if this is too wide and I'm only putting two bars in, you're gonna have a cracking problem. And so it'll be better to go to a smaller number of bars to look at it. So that would be one way to be, to be able to kind of assess this. Okay, so you're gonna do this a couple of times with a couple of different patterns. You'll do two number 11s. You'll do the same problem again with what is four number eights, and then go even further to look at seven number sixes. All are equivalent amounts of steel and just kind of looking at what the spacing is and do you have a spacing problem, you know, as far as the distribution of the steel. Okay, now there are, there are other requirements that you'll find out when we get into like columns and distribution of reinforcing around a perimeter that will take into account some of these ideas. And that's part of the reasoning that they set those is to help control the cracking and get the seal spread out through the cross section so that the stresses get spread out through the cross section. So there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff going on with regards to serviceability, but this, what we've talked about in this video is the most explicit check for serviceability and crack control um, characteristics, okay? Um, and then, oh, we do have one more. I'm gonna have you guys do the case with seven number sixes, but this time they're distributed a little bit differently. So you, for this one, you'll have to find the centroid and then run through the calculations and tell me what's going on. And I've given you the spacing between the bars as one inch. So anyway, uh, that's what we have for today. I hope it's been, this has kind of been a short lesson, a quick lesson. It's not hard. It's just, it's one of those things that you have to check as you started to, 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 to choose your bar sizes. And this is kind of leads us to, you know, some of those rules of thumbs that we talked about earlier with, you know, designing for flexural strength, where we said that, you know, not that, that the, the, you know, when you, when you calculate your area of steel required, you know, with, you know we needed 3.4 inches squared. Well, we'll just use four number nines. Okay, when we did that, we didn't consider anything about how these bars were spread out over the cross section or how they were spaced relative to each other. We did kind of check some minimums, you know, back early on, on uh, the practical considerations video, but this is where it's in there. And it's, it's these checks that not only affect you know, the, the, the bar selection and the quantity of the bars it makes us a unique animal to concrete design. You don't ever see this kind of thought in steel design, but for, for us, you know, you know, for a flexural member, a six, a seven, even an eight are typically the, are optimum sizes for not only, you know, for strength and being able to fit things in, but also for um, crack control, which is what you'll see in this exercise, as well as developmental length. And we talked about those in earlier videos. Okay, so there's a lot of these little, you know, getting into those larger bar sizes where they're convenient for getting a lot of steel in one area, from a serviceability standpoint, they're not a great choice. And so that's why if we can get into sixes and sevens, that's, you know, typically cracking becomes less of an issue and we're assured of getting uh, getting things spaced out appropriately. Now, obviously, as these dimensions change, if this becomes really, really wide, then I need a lot more bars to cover it. Or if it becomes really, really narrow, maybe I can get away with just one bar. And so it kind of, there's a lot of this, this play on not only geometry, but also number of bars um, within the, in the region. And that's kind of what we're looking at with our crack control episodes. So anyway, I hope this has made sense. If you've got any questions, leave some comments down below and I'll be happy to answer them. And as always, if you find this video useful or helpful to you, please be sure to uh, like or subscribe to the video and we will see you guys next time. Have a great afternoon. Happy engineering.